All right, everybody, I am Bull Jesse now. So whatever you put in the comments to ask me to do, I will do it. I'm going to say yes to everything. Oh, no, that's a very bad idea, isn't it? Hello, everybody. I am back to review my favorite Star Trek show with its second episode of its third season, that being Star Trek Lower Decks, The Least Dangerous Game. Clearly the title alluding to the most dangerous game, with Boimler being the least dangerous as we will see later on in the episode. And that, that, that fits my good old Brad. I love him, I love him to death, but not exactly very dangerous. Except for in the sack. As per usual, I'll stay spoiler free for about a minute up front and then I'll get fully into spoilers and break down the episode scene by scene in just a moment. But staying spoiler free, this was another strong episode. Not as strong, in my opinion, as the premiere, but there is a lot of fun stuff throughout this. Again, lots of little gags and references and ideas and things like that, and a lot of particular references to two things that I really, really love about Star Trek that don't get enough reference, and that is the Kelvin timeline movies. There's some fun little bits with that, as well as Gene Roddenberry's favorite kind of planets, the uh, sexy wellness planets that you'd see in episodes like Anytime Rice is on screen or the uh, season one episode of The Next Generation, Judgment. So clearly very fun to see both of those things, but... As per usual, what I always love Lower Decks the most for is its character arcs. And I already can see that this episode is not only continuing the character arc that we saw with Mariner beginning in last episode, where she is someone learning that she needs to like let go of control, needs to learn that she can't always dominate a situation and to trust others and work alongside others and believe in others. That's sort of her main arc and that is continued here that we saw beginning in the premiere. But we also get a new arc for Boimler. Last season, Boimler's arc was more about him gaining confidence in his self and his own voice as a captain and what he wants to be as a person pursuing being a captain. And I really love some of the nuances that we got to see last season where he like stood up for his friends, uh, didn't always go with the crowd that was like, we're going to be captains and, and just sort of fall in with that group. And also just seeing that he actually was an intelligent, smart guy who could believe in himself and have confidence, something that he didn't have at the beginning of season one. And so I liked that arc for him. But now we need to see him break out of his more rich like I'm gonna follow the rules I'm gonna dot every T dot every I something that he's been in, on a journey on for most of the series but this is where it's really starting to become explicit where he really is starting to break out of that shell and I, I think that that is going to be the arc that we're gonna see for him this season but at the very least within this episode it's a great storyline for him to be on that being said this is the last note for my spoiler free section not that I need every episode to like wow me or shock me but the twists and turns of this plot I was fairly expecting like once I saw what the storyline was for these characters I was like all right I can already see what they're doing here and where it's going to lead and the big twists and revelations and the resolutions of the plot uh, didn't exactly shock me or uh, I kind of really just saw coming and, and saw a mile away. That doesn't make them bad by any means. I'm not like saying, oh, this is awful or terrible. I, I think they were effectively done, but I just sort of like, yep, I, I see exactly how this is going to be laid out over the next 10 minutes of the episode uh, and there was no real twists or turns or surprises other than the gags and jokes they got that we got to see. So effectively told, effectively done, and I think fits these characters well and I love where it's setting up our characters' journeys to go for the rest of the season. But as its own, I did love a lot of the jokes, but it wasn't exactly the most revelatory or shocking storyline that Lower Decks has ever done. But as always, in a good episode of Lower Decks is still pretty damn great uh, compared to most other shows. So I was very, very pleased with this one. But to talk about it more, I'm going to get into spoilers. So getting into spoilers, the first scene of the episode is wonderful and we get to see the uh, Lower Deckers playing a game of Dungeons and Dragons Klingon style. Bathlets and Banox is how I think you say it. Um, I will let you know right up front, I actually did get to see this uh, scene back when uh, I was at Star Trek Mission Chicago. They actually aired this scene for uh, all of us at Mission Chicago if you were there, uh, and we told, were told not to talk about it. Uh, so uh, I didn't say anything about it at the time, but this is the scene that we got to see, and it was a lot of fun. It was great to see J.G. Hertzler back as Martok. He has appeared in the show previously. He's played a couple like alien creatures uh, throughout the series so far, I think in like season one or so, and maybe in season two as well. Uh, but him being back as Martok, our favorite Klingon character, sorry, apologies to Worf, it was just so great to see him. Um, I, it's funny story, this is a random aside, but funny story, I actually used to work at a um, Starbucks store in Ithaca, New York after I graduated college. The same Starbucks store, by the way, that uh, Starbucks recently closed because they unionized. That's a whole different story. Uh, but regardless, I used to work at that store and J.G. Hertzler actually lives in Ithaca, New York and would sometimes come in from time to time. I'm like, oh my God, it's a bar talk and I got to serve him coffee, uh, which is very sweet. Never really talking about Star Trek because I wouldn't want to be that person. Uh, the like annoying barista who ranted at him about Star Trek. I'm sure he gets that a lot. Uh, but it was just cool to see him. Uh, so that was just fun. I used to serve Martok coffee. Uh, Ractagino, as they would say. Anyways, getting back to this uh, episode, I did like that they addressed in this uh, that uh, this Martok wasn't actually like the real Martok because he's busy running the Klingon Empire at this point. 
Uh, but he, this is like a Ferengi knockoff thing, and they have like Gowron expansion packs, which is all all very fun. I love that. Again, I love these jokes that Lower Decks does that are like fun references, but are also world building as well. Like now, from those jokes, we know that like Ferengi like sell D and D games and and make these things and like use like surreptitious means to get people's images, as well as the fact that we know that Martok is still the uh, Chancellor of the Klingon Empire at this point in the Star Trek timeline. So like those two jokes are funny. They're nice little references, but also world build. These are what I love Lower Decks jokes to do. But then we also get a little scene with Boimler being upset that uh, Vendome, who was a character we saw in previous seasons, is now a captain because he took risks, who was bold. Uh, so a char- th- something, that Bo- something that Boimler doesn't really do. And we also get Mariner getting shoved off to be with Ransom as they go down to the planet that they're above to help fix the orbital lift or space elevators that uh, <laughs> that Mariner calls them, which is what they are. And it made me think there's a Star Trek Voyager episode where uh, Neelix and Tuvok get stuck on a space elevator. Uh, maybe think of that episode. Uh, though clearly, visually, it's evoking Star Trek 2009 with Nero's ship's mining thing that we see destroy Vulcan in that movie is clearly what the visuals are evoking and will even more so later on. But I love that once we get onto these space elevators, uh, Rutherford and Billups go down to the planet because Ransom wants to stay with Mariner to do the engineering stuff. With Mariner being like, no, we should be doing that job. We we, we can speak to these people. We know what to do. It's, it's part of our job as command people. But Ransom really trying to teach Mariner a lesson that she can't always control things, which is the thing I think she does need to learn as a character. And just focusing in on the storyline, I love all the jokes that, like, as they constantly call back to the engineers on the planet, things get worse and worse. It starts off being like, yeah, they, we, they're all sexy. It's very Gene Roddenberry-esque, like, sex planets that Gene Roddenberry used to love uh, writing into, into Star Trek. But then, like, like there's all these, like, miscommunications. Like, oh, no, they saw our naval, and it, like, led to, like, this misunderstanding. And it just gets weirder and weirder. There's, like, a sentient volcano. There's a sentient computer. There's a godlike telepathic baby who's their leader. Uh, the the tele- the sentient computer, by the way, made me think of Jeffrey Coombs' character from last season. There's a lot of sentient evil computers ruling planets in Star Trek. Uh, and I just love that it gets crazy and weirder every time they call. The moment we get down to the planet, it turns out all that stuff that they were saying is true. Uh, and and uh, that was just wonderful. But I also love, like, Mariner getting more and more upset. And then eventually just the point where she like jumps off the ship skydiving off the orbital lift like Star Trek 2009 but then Ransom like you know what you were right we should go down and help them and sure having to climb all the way up even up a climbing wall because it's a wellness based society uh, I thought that was hysterical and again fits her character of needing to learn that she should uh, like trust others to do the right thing and like she can speak up and say her mind but like she should be able to work as a team and have multiple skills and trust in, in others not just thinking that she has to do it all herself it's a character it's a good character flaw to discuss like she thinks she has to carry the weight of the world on her shoulders and she doesn't need to and this episode is showing that uh eventually getting down to the planet and then ransom uh being all sexy and tough and him being able to like convince the wellness society that everything's going to be okay in the typical star trekian way of being able to talk their way out of things uh, i loved that and then ransom uh getting a compliment from mariner and like putting her down but also being like yeah no that was nice and it was very sweet uh moment again fits mariner's arc this episode so all of that was great but what was more fun for me was everything to do with Boimler. This storyline was, again, fairly predictable. They're doing a yes man plot where Boimler's sort of pushed by Tandy to say yes to everything to sort of break out of his shell. Very, very uh, Jim Carrey yes man movie uh, stuff. But some of the stuff that they do is great. Uh, where Boimler playing like the uh, spring ball like uh, O'Brien and Bashir did back in Deep Space Nine where they started off their friendship and I believe season one or two of that show was great. The Bajoran dirges that uh, Boimler gets stuck into and that he just has a great voice for because of his scream Jack Quaid's classic Boimler screams uh, are always wonderful and I love that it's actually <laughs> like like his dulcet tones like make uh, people uh, cry in the Bajoran Dirges was great uh, and then that earning him the respect of, uh, of Shax and other people on board the ship and him like feeling like oh yeah this is how I should do things uh, eventually leading him to uh, meet up with this crash dude who's like can I hunt you and Boimler saying yes even though the dude's scary and everything to do with this guy was great like him like sneaking around the corner hilarious uh, and then him chasing Boimler around the ship and I love also the joke is like there are three types of prey and he's like Boimler's like what's the third one it's a lizard thing that doesn't apply to you <laughs> all of this was wonderful uh, Boimler jumping into cetacean ops it was good to see cetacean ops again and then being like no don't jump in with your dirty clothes and he's a drama magnet that was hilarious uh, then him running into the captain comes like oh we got to respect his culture you know you gotta you you promised him uh and then Boimler eventually turning and becoming the hunter or trying to and giving like that long speech that you know this is a storyline that we've seen before and other things and shows like yeah I'm gonna become the hunter now uh, and giving like that long speech was eventually leaves him open but it does also prove his character that he needs to be bold he needs to push back he needs to like do the crazy weird thing that he normally wouldn't have done and that's the best thing to do and he earns this guy's respect and I obviously we all knew that Boimler was gonna die by this guy uh so I kind of figured that the joke was going to be 
that he wasn't trying to actually kill Boimler. Uh, it was just like a minor misunderstanding or something that Boimler didn't understand. Again, not terribly surprised, but fits the arc of the story that this was going for. And it was very, very funny. Uh, and I, I like Boimler like, oh God, can I go to the sick bay? Uh, and him like not getting his arm back uh, to full equipment, uh, to full health was great. But then this brings us to the final scene of the episode where everyone's back on the D&D &D game. Uh, and I love our lower deckers just hanging out and having fun and, and getting to play games like that. And by the way, I didn't mention this earlier. I actually really love this D&D &D game and hope it becomes a recurring thing, possibly. Just because, like, every Starfleet crew has, like, a thing. Like, uh, Strange New Worlds, Pike has his, like, dinners that he do does in cooking. The Next Generation crew had the poker game. Uh, Deep Space Nine had darts and things like that. And I would actually really love if this show's thing is, like, a D&D &D game. Because that would fit the, like, nerdiness of the show really, really well. And also our lower deckers really well. So hopefully this will come back. I, I would like it to be like a recurring bit, uh, like like the poker game in the next generation. But we'll see if that actually turns out to be the case. But it does lead to Boimler at the end of the episode being like, yeah, I'm bold Boimler now. I'm going to constantly do this stuff. Uh, this is who I am now. And it leads me to wonder if his arc this season is going to be like finding that middle ground where he should go out and be take risks, be bold, try new things uh, to try and get to be a captain that he wants to be. But also, uh, he can't do that all the time because it would just put him in danger and make him kind of silly and dumb and put other people at risk as well. So I hope that that like moderation is like what he needs to learn as opposed to Mariner's Ark, who needs to learn to like let other people uh, take control of sometimes and trust them. Uh, I think that that those would be like interesting parallel arcs for those two characters. So to wrap out, another strong episode of Lower Decks, not as strong as the premiere in my opinion, but still a lot of fun and clearly sets uh, arcs for Boimler and Mariner. Uh, the one thing I will say is like an overall critique is I'm curious to see what our uh, season long storyline is going to be for Rutherford and Tendi. Those characters have been in the episode so far, but they haven't really been centralized. And Tendi is, of course, my favorite character. So I am very curious to see what their arcs are going forward and not just focusing on Brad and uh, Mariner, uh, but those characters get some fleshing out, which I trust the show to do. Um, I'm not like saying this is a bad thing or anything, but it's one of those like, oh, give me some more Tendi, I want some Tendi. Uh, so hopefully we'll see that in the near future, what their arcs and uh, character dreams are going to be going forward. But for a continuation of Mariner and a start of Brad's arcs, this was great. So that's my thoughts on Lower Decks. Still loving the show as always. I wasn't doubting that in the slightest. I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below, but beyond all that I hope that you as always my wonderful friends live long and prosper